maybe we should talk about why protein is such a strong stimulus for sure. increased muscle protein synthesis. Yeah. What I mean, what is it about protein? The essential amino acids. The yeah. Yeah. So y you said it. I mean, uh, go back to the brick wall analogy. If that's muscle protein. Uh, it's made up of 20 different types of bricks. Those are the 20 amino acids that we have, nine of which are essential. Uh, uh, we need to get them in our diet. And in particular, there are a group of uh, what are called branch chain uh, amino acids that are three of the nine. And the most potent, if you like, of the three branch chains is an amino acid called leucine. And the way I like to explain it to people is that it's, it's kind of like the, the brick that when it arrives, it turns the process on. And I, I'm intentionally doing that because I always just like to remind people it's like a dimmer switch. So it's not, you know, click, click on, click off. It's really like you're, you know, leucine comes along and it begins, you see the lights begin to come on. And the lights obviously are the process of making new muscle proteins. So once you have sufficient leucine there, you can turn the switch up as, as bright as it can go. Uh, once you put more leucine there, you, you can't go any higher. Um, for older people, for reasons that we're beginning to unravel now, uh, I think what happens is now the sensitivity of that dimmer switch, so you, the leucine comes and you sort of get this response. And a younger person, you might get that. And so we need more leucine or more branch chains or more essential amino acids, which translates into more. You need more protein to trigger the whole turning the protein synthetic process on. So um, it, it's, it's a pretty nuanced level, I think, of understanding, but we're beginning to see on when we look at diets that people eat, that people who consume higher quality proteins or sufficient lower quality proteins, which I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to, um, it's, it's really about the leucine that they consume, particularly for their muscle, uh, that, that's important. Yeah. yeah. You, talking about the, uh, the leucine and going, kind of circling back to that, I, and I want to get into, to, you know, underlying causes of, of, of sarcopenia, mm. um, and, but bef kind of before that we get there, the, the leucine supplementa supplementation does come up mm -hmm. in my mind sure. and um, probably in a lot of other people's minds. It's like, can I supplement with leucine mm. and not have to take in so much protein and have a similar effect on muscle protein synthesis? Yeah, really great question. And, and we have done some studies where we haven't, uh, well, at proof of principle, we, we supplemented people with leucine, and we did find that it improved the response. A little, you know, the, the caveat statements. First of all, leucine is, of all of the 20 amino acids, and I know everybody hasn't, you know, done this sort of thing, but leucine is, it, it's extraordinarily bitter. Uh, so it doesn't taste great, um, so you need a, a bit of food science to, to take that edge off, I think. Uh, from my perspective, uh, that would be sort of a last resort because it's, it's really, you know, you, it, it should always be a food first approach and then maybe a supplement. And now you're bringing it down to the individual component. And, you know, you probably get a sense of this from some of the studies that we've seen with individually purified components of like a tomato. And it was, oh, it's lycopene. That's really important when actually there's things in the whole tomato, that the matrix and other things, and lots of bioactive compound. We have no idea what they're doing, and probably the tomato is better for you than just the lycopene alone. So, you know, that's, that's my, <laughs> my sort of ethos statement to say, you know, leucine supplementation, uh, if you must. Um, buyer beware, make sure it comes from a reputable company. Uh, the internet is, is, is rife with crummy supplements and you, you just need to know where it's coming from. So usually look for third party testing. Uh, I tend to like domestic production. So, you know, North America, if you can. Um, and, a lot, and then a lot of people say, well, what about branch chain supplements? And I'm like, yeah, it's really interesting. Like they stuck around as a sports supplement for, for a long, long time. I think the, the, the message is fairly clear now that they're largely, I won't say useless, um, but from useful to useless, they're a lot closer to the useless end. Um, but it's only the leucine out of those three amino acids uh, that's the important branch chain amino acids. So they work because of the leucine. So then people say, well, I'm on a high protein diet. I supplement with whey and, and I'm taking branch chains. And <laughs> 
there's a great uh, Instagram meme where I see a guy in a, you know, a pool, it's raining and he's drinking water. So it's sort of like, that's where the branch chains are. I'm like, you're surrounded by good stuff. The branch chains are probably not a big deal. But for older people, um, we've done some work and I, it's possible you're gonna see products that are they're fortified with a little bit of extra leucine. It, it, do, do you absorb leucine like in free form yeah. and it doesn't have to be a certain form? No. Oh, okay. No, you, you absorb it in free form. In fact, it's, it's, it's really readily absorbed. Uh, the big barrier in all the studies we've ever done is how to mask it, its taste. So you can imagine given its, its taste profile, we mix it with uh, some sort of citrus and legumey, uh, excuse me, um, citrus fruit uh, flavor um, and try and sort of blend that sharp bitter edge into like oh it's lemon it's uh, orange it's grapefruity you know something and that tends to be a, a good mix but uh, yeah i'm not a food scientist pineapple, pineapple yeah, yeah something like it, that so you said fortified for the for older individuals yeah. let's say that are you know you know as you mentioned you know the when you get older your satiation like those mm -hmm. the, those hormones are all different and yep. people don't eat as much right they're not hungry as much yep. and they certainly don't chew as well. I mean, all sorts of factors, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you can get, you know, if you can get someone who's having a hard time, like there's just no way they're going to get 0.4 mm -hmm. grams of protein per kilogram body weight. Like right. the, the leucine supplementation may help with that older person. Yeah, we, and we, we've shown that. And I mean, I think it's not just our work. Lots of other people, uh, collaborators of mine, good friends of mine have shown the same thing, that if you take even a small protein dose and you add a little bit of extra leucine, you can make it look as if it's a bigger protein dose. And so, you know, our, our dimmer switch analogy is that, you know, here's a small protein dose and you get that response. Here's the small protein dose with leucine and now you get a slightly greater you said response. was it four to five grams? What was it? Uh, it, it you know, the, the per meal leucine dose is probably somewhere in the range of sort of three to four grams for an older person, probably two to three for younger. And that's just because the younger person is really sensitive to the effects. But we can make a younger person, when we put a brace on their leg and we get local atrophy, their atrophied muscle looks like an older person's response. So the disuse response, we think, is sort of, it's almost a model of, of premature aging in terms of your muscle anyway. The difference is a young person does this and they just bounce back. An older person does this and now they're down here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about mechanisms and, yeah. and uh, because there's some, there was definitely some surprises and interesting you know, yeah. findings when I was reading a lot of uh, the literature, and, sure. including uh, predominantly yours. Um, so what Leucine, its major role in activating muscle protein synthesis is through mTOR? Yes, through mTOR. Very good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, mTOR is one of these, it, 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 you know, it's a highly conserved uh, protein. It's a, sort of an integrative nexus of all kinds of anabolic stim, uh, stimuli, including resistance exercise. So, or any form of exercise, it's actually running through, through mTOR. Leucine goes through mTOR. Its, it's dysregulation is involved in all kinds of processes, including cancer and, and, and lots of other things. So uh, it has a really centrally important role in integrating all of those anabolic signals. Um, there are some thoughts now that there are actually two complexes of mTOR, one that's sensitive to nutrients, one that's actually more sensitive to exercise. Um, and you know, one function is a little bit different than the other, but the, the ultimate culmination is that the downstream signals after you've stimulated mTOR are to turn on protein synthesis and all of the regenerative or anabolic processes to repair any uh, or recover from any stress that's been uh, exposed. So yeah, it's, it's essentially important protein. We study it a lot. We're by no means experts in it. There are people that are far better at it than I am. So, yeah. yeah. So inhibiting the one like mTORC1, which is the nutrient sensitive Correct. complex yeah. with something like rapamycin yep. could affect muscle protein synthesis, but not because there's also mTORC2 activity going Correct. on. If a person is resistance training, yep. maybe does it, what is it? not as big of a deal or is it still still does yeah I, I mean I, I think like I said you know the uh, the benefits of the resistance training through probably through mTOR2 are, are, are like this you know you still get the protein synthetic response 
Um, with mTORC1, I mean, that's where the sort of thinner layer of the, the nutrient uh, added stimulation goes on top of resistance training. So as you say, uh, one's sensitive to rapamycin, the other one actually isn't. Uh, so, you know, the, the more we uncover with this, the more we realize we probably, you know, 10 years ago, we thought we had it figured out. Now we're not even close. And so now we're beginning to understand that mechanical stress from exercise is rooted through a different process than nutrient uh, stimulation of protein synthesis. So, you know, maybe that's the underpinning mechanism why a lot of people talk about, you know, restricting protein and not wanting to turn on the overly or overly turn on the anabolic side of things and, you know, because uncontrolled growth and, well, you know, at cell level, that's cancer. Um, but as I point out to people, uh, you know, persistent exercise also activates mTOR on an almost chronic basis if you exercise every day. Um, and now we're like, well, actually, it's signaling through a different process. So maybe that's why it's, it's beneficial. And this one, if it's chronically turned up, is not so good. Yeah, and it also goes back to some of the observational data we were talking about also a, a couple hours ago or whenever it was when you're looking at protein intake, specifically animal protein versus plant protein, and animal protein, as you pointed out, is higher in essential amino acids, yeah. including leucine. And, um, you know, so you look at these all-cause mortalities and these cancer-related mortalities, and there is definitely um, conflicting data for yes. sure. But there is an overall, like, there's a lot of studies showing that there's a lower all-cause mortality and a lower cancer-related mortality in people that consume plant proteins. Yep. However, when you start to look at the largest observational studies that have been done, it, those, those, those studies that have looked for any, like, unhealthy lifestyle factors or yep. confounding factors have found that, oh, actually people that have no unhealthy lifestyle factors, so they're not obese, not yep. sedentary, not smoking, not excessively drinking alcohol, they have a similar all-cause mortality as a plant-eating person.